Hello, I'm Bernard Taylor and this is Fez Physics. Stay tuned, of course, for my next Fez Physics video coming out every Friday around about two o'clock Greenwich Mean Time. But first of all, you should, of course, be trying to read more widely in physics. These popular and very re readable books that I've got listed are interesting in themselves and could be something you mention in your university application or indeed in a university interview. Uh, I've got some books here by well-known authors, Paul Davies, Brian Greene, John Gribbin, Michio Kaku, and Lisa Randall. Keep on reading. So, my next presentation is about material properties. And of course, the property of a particular material uh, can depend on its dimensions, such as its size, its shape, we have physical uh, properties such as its density, its conductivity, its electrical conductivity, its heat conductivity, sound properties, how well sound transmits through the material, its optical properties, and perhaps its combustibility. Its mechanical properties, which we're gonna focus on in this presentation, relate to strength, toughness, elasticity, plasticity, stiffness, ductility, brittleness, hardness, and a few other things as well. Chemical properties, how does it respond to uh, acidity or alkalinity, to any weathering, to any corrosion? We're not so much interested in, in this presentation, but they are important factors. So what is an elastic material? Yes, it'll return to its original shape once the load is removed, typically an elastic band. Or up to a certain point, those sweets known as cololases. A plastic uh, material, it will remain deformed, it will remain in its new shape once the load is removed, typically plasticine or well-chewed chewing gum. So what is a stiff material? A stiff material is one which doesn't easily change shape when a force is applied. Steel, polo sweets, there are many others, but bear in mind that steel and polo sweets have other properties, other descriptors as well. And of course, what we're trying to do is get you more used to these particular descriptors and others. So what do we mean by ductile, malleable, brittle? tough. Think about these for a moment. Ductile? Yeah, a ductile material can be pulled into a thinner shape. Uh, metals are ductile because they can be pulled into a wire. Well-chewed chewing gum can be pulled into a, a thinner shape. Malleable. Now this is an interesting one. Um, materials that a malleable can be deformed under compression. A fudge. Have you tried hammering fudge? I'm not really sure. But why am I mentioning hammering? Because the Latin word malleus means hammer. And if we take a small piece of gold, if you hammer down a small piece of gold, and you hammer it gently, you can hammer it into gold leaf, which has a very very thin uh, uh, cross-sectional area. Um, a brittle material. Brittle materials are those which crack or snap easily. How, how does this, what's involved with this cracking or snapping? Well, cracks propagate really very quickly through the material. Glass is the classic example and some biscuits are really quite brittle. Rich tea bris biscuits, one of my favorites. A tough material, well, a large force produces a small deformation and it can withstand dynamic loads, a sudden shock or impact. And as we'll see in a moment, uh, tough materials are good at absorbing the energy of a collision. And of course, Kevlar absorbing the energy of a a projectile such as a bullet or perhaps a knife, high tensile steel as well. 
this exam question was only, I think, for a few marks, but look at it. We've got snapped and an unsnapped uh, curtain hook. And the student thinks it's odd that the material the hooks are made from is referred to as plastic when the hooks don't show plastic behavior. Aha. The student finds the following list of terms used to describe the materials, brittle, ductile, hard, malleable, and tough. Hmm. How are we going to answer this? Well, plastic behavior is when the material does not return to its original shape once the load, once the force is removed. Okay, but this snapped hook shows brittle behavior. It breaks or snaps, cracks propagate through it with very little plastic deformation. This exam question talks about uh, a decoration of an Anglo-Saxon uh, gold shoulder clasp from the very famous Sutton Hoo ship burial uh, can be seen in the British uh, the, um, the artifacts from it can be seen in the British Museum well worth seeing it's to do with hammering gold sheet fixing thin gold wires filling compartments that are formed with an enamel paste and heating the paste and the gold and forming a sh hard, shiny, attractive layer. Okay, gold can be hammered to form the basic shape. It is. Gold can be made into thin wires. It is. What are the descriptors here? Yes, of course, gold is malleable. Gold is ductile. Now, when the gold wire is stretched, its load extension or force extension graph would have this kind of shape shown below. And we're asked to name the property exhibited in region A. Well, in region A, isn't it essentially a straight line? Force extension graph is a straight line. It would appear to obey Hooke's law. And yes, region A is elastic behavior. It will return to its original shape when the load is removed much like an elastic band would do. Now, over here, we've got a number of um, descriptors on the left-hand side and their definitions. And what I would like you to do is to take a little bit of time to see if you can match the descriptor to the description. For example, um, We've got here hard, a hard material, a hard material. Oh, which one is that? Hard material, we could draw, whoops, my cursor has disappeared. Uh, we could draw a line. A hard material is one which is not readily scratched or indented. Um, an elastic material that we were talking about a moment ago, an elastic material. Would it remain deformed when the load is removed? No, certainly not. An elastic material returns to its original shape when the load is removed. You need to know these definitions. So try that little exercise and answers are at the end of this presentation. Hardness testing. Yes, we can scratch certain materials with, with perhaps a diamond tip, but another type of hardness testing is Brunel testing. And essentially what we've got is at the top is a material um, which has a ball bearing, high tensile steel ball bearing perhaps, uh, with a load on top of it. And with a particular load, if the material is not very hard, then the diameter of the crater, if you like, that's uh, formed will be quite large and vice versa. Um, here we have a Brunel hardness testing 
um, apparatus, got the specimen, we've got the indenter, and we can get readouts. Much of this is, is uh, computerized, so we can get uh, a measure of the hardness of the material. Now, down below, we've got this Charpy tester. And I want you to imagine that this specimen under test is down here and it's being hit by this pendulum. And this pendulum is from above is striking the material. This is the specimen under test. And if we let the pendulum go from somewhere up here, if it swings through the material, breaks it and swings right up here again, then we would say that it's not a very tough material because not much of that energy has been absorbed. Not much of the kinetic energy of the pendulum has been absorbed. But if the pendulum only perhaps moves up to here, when it was let go from here, we can get a measure of how much energy is absorbed by that specimen Okay, it's a specimen of a certain size, certain dimensions. And that gives us a measure of how tough that material is. Okay, let's move on. Uh, tension testing or compression testing. On the right hand side, this is an experiment that you may well have done yourself. Uh, low down the, the school, we've got uh, a weight. We happen to have spring here. It could equally be uh, an elastic band or some other material and we can measure the extension. And if a material obeys Hooke's law, then the force is directly proportional to the extension, or F equals Kx. F is the load or the tension, X is the extension, and K, uh, well, if we're dealing with springs, it's sometimes known as the spring constant, sometimes known as the elastic constant, but also we refer to it as the stiffness the stiffness of the material. Now, we know that some materials are, some specimens of the same material are stiffer than others. Let's follow up with this. Here we've got a force extension graph for different combinations of elastic bands. Now, of course, all of them are obeying Hooke's law, and we've got the gradient of all three, A, B, and C. And we've got the stiffness for A as being 375 newtons per meter, and so on. Well, let's just look at this. C, which is the least stiff, is three thin elastic bands in series tied together. B is two thin bands in series, it's certainly stiffer. And A is three thicker bands uh, in series, all tied together in series. And this is the same elastic material. But look, let's take a force of 10 newtons. 10 newtons, if we go across that extension, is about 0 0.2, is it 0.25 uh, meters? But if we go across further, this extension of B is greater, and the extension of, oops, of C is even greater. So we can see here that the stiffer material all of the things being equal, the stiffer material shows the larger, the, the, the smaller extension. So, one of the things that you will come on to in this course is stress strain and the young modulus. Now, we'll come back to this, but stress is defined as force over area, strain as the extension over the original length, and the young modulus is defined as stress over strain. Don't worry too much about these terms. My original graph here is a graph of stress against strain. But look, stress, which is force over cross-sectional area, isn't that just a bit like force? Yeah, 
So I put the label force on there, on the y-axis. Strain, well, strain is extension over the original length. The original length of our specimen, whether it be a wire or an elastic band, is not going to change much at all. But strain is like extension. So in a sense, this graph is a little bit like the graph of force against extension. And of course, the first part of it is a straight line, constant gradient. Ah, the gradient of stress of a strain is the young modulus. But hold on, we also know that, that for a force extension graph, that straight line area is where it obeys Hooke's law and it exhibits elastic behavior. Now, this general shape for a, a metal specimen in this case um, is something that we will come back to. So I've said the material obeys Hooke's law up to the limit of proportionality, elastic behavior up to this point. After the elastic limit, that's point E, the material behaves plastically. The material will not return to its original shape when the stress or force is removed. It will be permanently stretched, if you like. Change of shape. After the yield point, the material starts to stretch without any extra load. This is plastic deformation. And, well, this might be where we're also getting a ductile behavior. But you'll come across uh, these terms, stress, strain, and the young modulus, and the behavior of metals, as I say, a little bit later in this course. What do we mean by the viscosity of a liquid? Water and honey have a different viscosity. Yes, viscosity is to do with the flow of a liquid. Yeah, honey flows less easily than water, so honey is more viscous. And if we drop a ball bearing through a um, measuring cylinder containing honey or washing up liquid or whatever, then that will, it, will, it will travel through that liquid more slowly than it would if that liquid were water. And we'll come on to this point in, in a moment because this is an important method for working out, for measuring the viscosity of a liquid. So, Let's think about a marble or a ball bearing falling through oil or even washing up liquid. There is a viscous drag force, which is in the opposite direction to the motion. The viscous drag force is described by Stokes's law, F equals six pi R eta V. Now, it's worth remembering that this applies only with laminar flow only with laminar flow. And usually exam questions, when they're talking about uh, the various forces that are on a ball bearing, they're talking about the situation where the ball bearing has reached terminal velocity, in other words, balance forces are acting. So we've defined our terms, R, eta, and V. And eta equals F of six pi R V, which gives the unit, units of viscosity as newton seconds meters to the minus two or pascal seconds since pressure equals force over area which is newtons over square meters and a figure i wouldn't remember this but the viscosity of water at 20 degrees centigrade i found out is taken as one times 10 to the minus three pascal seconds Now, what about Archimedes' principle? Well, if we take a Newton meter and we uh, hang a metal block from it, and let's say we get a reading of 20 Newtons, that's the weight of the metal block. If we take the same metal block and we immerse it in water, uh -huh, we find that the Newton meter only reads 10 Newtons. So there must be an upward force, an upthrust on the metal of 
20 minus 10, which of course is 10 newtons. Now Archimedes principle, the upthrust, whatever it is, is equal to the weight of fluid displaced. Now remember, upthrust is a force in newtons, the weight of a fluid also in newtons. And we also need to remember that density is mass over volume, but I'm sure you know that already. So here's our sphere. It's falling through a fluid. It's experiencing viscous drag, an upthrust force, and the weight is downwards. Now, the upthrust is the weight of the fluid displaced, which is the mass of the fluid times g. Well, mass is volume times density, and that's an important consideration in calculations. And here's a calculation that I want us to look at. A steel ball bearing of radius two times 10 to the minus three meters with a density, rho steel, is falling vertically through oil of density, rho of oil, and viscosity, eta. And we've got those values there. Part A, we're asked to use Stokes's law to calculate the viscous drag at a speed, and we would assume that's a terminal velocity. So we simply put the numbers in, F equals six pi R E to V, and you can check this for yourself, but that gives me a viscous drag force of about 4.64 times 10 to the minus five newtons, or even 4.6 times 10 to the minus five newtons, if we've been very good with significant figures. The volume of the ball bearing, the volume of a sphere is four thirds pi r cubed. Got the radius that was given earlier. And so the volume of the ball bearing, 3.35 times 10 to the minus eight cubic meters. Okay, on the left hand side, I'm just repeating the information should you need to refer to it. We're asked to calculate the mass of the ball bearing. Well, density is mass over volume, mass is density times volume. So we can find the mass of the ball bearing. A piece of gatto, certainly. Now we're asked to calculate the weight of the ball bearing. Well, W equals M times G. And W is 2.6 times 10 to the minus 4 kilograms. Now, what then is the volume, mass, and weight of the oil which the ball bearing uh, displaces? The volume of the oil is the same as the volume of the ball bearing. The mass of the oil, mass is density times volume. So we've got the mass of the Oil, the weight of the oil is its mass times g. So we've got the weight of the oil. Oh, isn't that the weight of the fluid displaced? It certainly is. So, what is the upthrust acting on the ball bearing? The upthrust is the weight of the fluid displaced, which is the weight of the oil. So that's why I've gone through that calculation. So now we've got values for the upthrust, the viscous drag, and you can find the weight of the ball bearing. And so you could now calculate the resultant force on the ball bearing. Try this. Are those balanced forces? Or perhaps they are not, not yet. Okay. Try this, go through this presentation again, take your time, look at the diagram of the three forces on the ball bearing and see if you can answer my question. Incidentally, my answer is at the end of this presentation. Here's my answers to the descriptors for material properties. There's my answer, but Thank you very much. This is Fez Physics and keep working.